If you will open your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And I want to read verses 11 through 15. We're going to look at verses 11 through 34 uh, as we study this passage for the message today. But I want to just uh, begin with looking at verses 11 through 15. Verse 11 says, Therefore, sailing from Troas, we ran a straight course to Samthracia, and the next day came to Neocopus. And from there to Philippi, which is in the foremost city of that part of Macedonia, a colony. And we were staying in that city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went out of the city to the riverside, where prayer was customarily made. And we sat down and spoke to the women who met there. Now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And when she and her household were baptized, she begged us saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my house and stay. So she persuaded us. Now, I like that phrase in verse 14 where it says that the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Let's bow together as we go to the Lord in prayer this morning. Father, thank you so much for just guiding us through this week. We thank you, Father, for uh, the blessings of the week, and we thank you, Lord, for the opportunity of today. And Lord, I pray that as we uh, have gathered on this special day, in this special place, that, Father, you'll uh, do a work in our hearts that will change us, make us better, stronger, more committed to you and your cause on this earth. Father, we do come today to lift up those that are on our prayer list, and there are a lot of names that are there, and there are needs that are represented by those names and individuals, and we pray for them. We especially lift John uh, up to you and uh, his uh, surgery and we just pray for recovery and for healing. Especially, Lord, we ask that your hand of healing would be upon his body, the different medications and things that the doctors are doing to, to help him overcome these issues with the infection. Lord, we just pray that according to your will and power that you could just touch him in a special manner and heal his body, and help him to recover uh, from this surgery. Lord, we thank you so much for him and Gene. Lift them up to you today and our prayers. Pray for Mike today, and pray that you give him a good day as he uh, goes through this weekend, and we ask for wisdom and guidance and direction on behalf of his doctors as they sit down with him tomorrow to discuss perhaps an, an alternate plan of action to fight the cancer in his face. We ask that you give those doctors great wisdom that comes from above, and we ask that your hand of healing would be used to touch his body as well. Father, we pray for churches across our association today. We ask that you just bless those churches, pastors that are already prepared and prayed up and ready to preach your word, and pray your Holy Spirit will come and just great power and in just uh, anoint those pastors to proclaim your word today. We pray for that in this service this morning, that our, our hearts will be challenged from the scriptures and from the thoughts the Holy Spirit will lay on our hearts as we read your word. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, if you'll open your Bibles this morning to Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. And I want us to look at verses 11 through 34 this morning. Oh, those are the verses I want us to focus on as we uh, study uh, this chapter. And I want to speak to you today on this subject, gospel transformation. Gospel transformation. Thus far in our study of uh, the book of Acts, particularly from chapters 13 through 16 now, there is one major theme that just keeps coming up over and over again. And that theme 
is the gospel. Uh, we've uh, given you a definition of the gospel, a biblical definition of the gospel. Uh, we saw that definition in 1 Corinthians chapter 15 in verses 1 through 4, particularly verses 3 through 4, lay out for us the gospel. What is the gospel? It's the good news that Jesus Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. That's the gospel, that Jesus Christ came to pay for our sins, that through his death and burial he put away our sins, and through his resurrection he can enable us to prevail over our sins. That's the gospel. So anytime ever anybody asks you that, that's the gospel. Now, the thing I noticed over these last weeks is that a big deal is being made in these chapters about the gospel. And not only is a big deal being made in these chapters about the gospel, a strong defense takes place on behalf of the gospel. A strong defense making sure that we don't add anything to the gospel. The gospel doesn't need any help. All it needs is communicated. And that really is what we've been learning in these chapters, is that our job, my job, your job, our job as a church is to communicate the gospel. That is to, to talk to people about the gospel. In fact, that really is what a church ought to be and it really is what a church ought to be about. We ought to look for opportunities. We ought to look for ways to, number one, connect with people in order that we might be able to communicate to them the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, now here's why that's all so important. The reason that the gospel is so important, the reason that it's so vital not to add anything to what Jesus did for us is because it is the gospel that brings change and transformation into the lives of people. I can't change anybody. You can't change anybody. But the gospel can. The power of God can change a heart and change a life. And really, as, as I looked at these passages that we're going to study this morning, the thing that just kept coming over and over again to me is that there is major transformation occurring in the lives of all three individuals that we're going to look at in, in Acts chapter 16, verses 11 through 34. So what is transformation? Let's just, let's just give that word a definition. What is transformation? If the, if the gospel is about transformation, what is transformation? And let me just give it to you in just two words. Number one, dramatic change. That's what the gospel and transformation is. Transformation is just simply dramatic change. Now notice I didn't just say what? I didn't just say change. Gospel transformation is about dramatic change. And I got news for you. If you, if you just think back to the day that you trusted Christ as personal Savior, guess what happened? Dramatic change occurred in your life. If you truly were saved and trusted Christ as personal Savior, dramatic change occurred. Now, now transformation is not being a good person. Transformation is not living a good life. Transformation is not turning over a new leaf. Transformation is living a whole new life. That's transformation. And, and it's really, I, I've, I've used this verse before, quoted it to you before. I, I want to read it to you, and, and if you want to turn to it and see it, I, I want to read 2 Corinthians 5, 17. I put me a block in my Bible uh, around this verse and put a little asterisk to the side, and I wrote gospel transformation. If you want a picture of gospel transformation, here it is. Well, what's gospel transformation? Gospel transformation is taking something that was and changing it into something that was not. That's gospel transformation. You see it right here in 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Listen to what this passage says. Therefore, if anyone, so anybody can be, if anyone is in Christ, he is a, what? He's a new creation. All things have what? Passed away. Behold, all things are what? They're new. That's gospel transformation. The gospel is the only thing I know that can take something that was and change it into something that was not. It can, it can make an entirely uh, drastic change in the life of a person or an individual. And that's what we're going to see happens in Acts chapter 16. I want to introduce you to three examples of gospel transformation. You're going to see them. They're familiar stories. We could preach on each one of these 
particular individuals in Acts chapter 16. But, but I want to look at them as a whole, and I want you to see them as examples of gospel transformation, as examples of God taking something that was and changing it into something that was not. We're going to see people that were one way, but once they heard the gospel and they responded to it, they, they were changed. A dramatic change occurred in their lives, and they all became something that they were not. So I want you to walk through these passages with me. We'll read them as we go along. And then I want you to see this, this gospel transformation, this dramatic change that occurs in people's lives. And it, it interested me, as I was studying this week, that these are, these are folks who come from different classes. These are folks who come from different backgrounds. These are folks who have different issues that they're dealing with in life. Guess what? It doesn't matter. The gospel can take care of all of those things. And that's what you see in, the, in this chapter. So I want you to notice three examples of gospel transformation. Number one, in verses 11 down through 15, I want you to see what I'm going to call the gospel transformation of a tender heart. Of a tender heart. And that's this lady that the Bible calls Lydia. I want you to notice about her, uh, going back to uh, Acts chapter 16, and beginning with verse uh, 11, you'll notice this is where in verse 11 and 12, uh, Paul sailed to, to the area of Philippi, and they begin their ministry there. They stayed there for a number of days, verse 12 says. And then verse 13 says, on the Sabbath day, they went out of the city, they went down by the riverside where prayer was customarily made. Now, it seems like such an insignificant beginning, doesn't it? Here's Paul, here, 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 here are uh, the disciples, and, and they go down to a little riverside prayer meeting, and it seems so insignificant. Reminds me of Zechariah 4.10 that says, Who hath despised the day of small things? God uses small things. God will even use small faith. He'll increase that to larger faith, and, and He'll give you a, a bold faith. And so it's a, it's a small, insignificant-looking beginning, but it starts something really major in this chapter. They encounter a group of women who are praying, and one lady in particular, the Bible gives us her name, is Lydia. And I call her a tender heart, a sensitive heart person. And, and the reason I say that is because you notice that the verse says in verse 15, uh, or, or verse 14, it says, now a certain woman named Lydia heard us. She was a seller of purple from the city of Tyre. She worshiped God, and you notice it says the Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. Now the reason she heeded them is because she had what? A sensitive heart. So the gospel transforms even that person who has just a sensitive, tender heart toward the things of God. Now I noticed uh, about three things uh, about this lady that I want you to see with me out of this uh, verse 14. I noticed first of all something about her livelihood. Notice what it says about her in verse uh, 13 uh, and 14. Verse 13 says that, that she was involved in that group of women who were praying, verse 13. Verse 14 says that she was a seller of purple. And that tells me something about her livelihood. I'm going to mention that a little bit later in the course of talking about her. But for right now, I just need you to understand that this is a business lady. She's a career person. She's a career woman. She is a seller of purple, which means she's handling some pretty expensive garments of that particular day. So that just lets you know about her livelihood. The gospel reaches out to women. It reaches out to all kinds of women. And I want you to notice not only something about her livelihood, but I want you to also notice something also about her location. Notice it says that she was from the area of Thyatira. See that? She was from the city, verse 14, of Thyatira. Now here's what we know about Thyatira. We know that there was a church there. We know that based on Revelation chapter 2, that there was a church in Thyatira. Now, I wish I could tell you, and I'm not being critical here, but I wish I could tell you that every church is a good church. 
But every church may not necessarily be a good church. I wish I could tell you that every church is a gospel preaching church. But every church may not be a gospel preaching church. Thyra Tyra was not a good church. In fact, there's another lady associated with that church in Revelation chapter 2, and her name's called Jezebel. And, ba and basically, when you, when you look at the church at Thyatira, what you discover is, is that here was the church that, that, that would welcome anything and everything. Jezebel was associated with Baal, associated with idols, associated with idol worship, and here is the church that wouldn't stand up for the gospel, and that was in the city of Thyatira from which this lady Lydia came. No wonder she's searching down by a riverside with a group of ladies who are praying. So I see something about her livelihood, I see something about her location, and I also notice something about her longing. You'll notice in this passage, verse 14, it says, she was a seller of purple from the city of Thyatira who worshipped God. She worshipped God. There was a longing in her heart for God. There was a desire in her life to connect with God. Now, she didn't know how to do that. We're going to find out that that happens to her because she comes in contact with somebody, his name Paul, who was doing one thing, communicating the gospel. And here's my point here. We don't know from day to day and from moment to moment, on the job, in the community, around the neighborhood, what sensitive, tender hearts we may be coming across that need to be communicated with and shared the gospel. So we just need to be on, on, on caution. We need to be on alert. We need to just be watching for those opportunities. So here she is. She has a longing. And there are two things here, sort of sub-points of that, that, that I want to just underscore looking at her life. One thing I, I, I learned about Lydia, and I think that she came to understand as well, is this. Religion, apart from Jesus, will leave you unsaved. Do you hear me? Religion, apart from Jesus, will leave you unsaved. Here's a lady who comes to the city of Philippi, she has a longing in her heart for the things of God, but she's never connected with that God. She's been around religion. Maybe she was a part of the church at Thyatira. We don't know. She certainly must have known about that church. But, but irregardless, she has a longing in her heart. She has a desire to worship God. But just religion, apart from a connection with Jesus Christ, will just leave you unsaved. Now I'll tell you a second thing I learned about her. Riches. Watch this now. She was a seller of purple, and that was an expensive garment in that day. Riches, apart from Jesus, will leave you unsatisfied. Here's a lady who has plenty. She's a seller of purple. Purple was a special dye that was used to dye the garments of royalty because purple was worn by royalty. So it cost a lot of money. In fact, when, when I went back and looked at this, they, they, they extracted the dye, the purple colored dye, from the throat of a shellfish. And from the throat of a shellfish, about one drop of dye would be extracted. So it was very costly, is my point. Very, very meticulous process that they went through to get that purple dye, to dye those garments that were worn by kings and those in authority and people of royalty. And for this lady to be involved in this business means that she was a very wealthy person, but yet those riches had not satisfied her. So I'm just saying what we need to remember when we come in contact with people is just religion uh, without Jesus is never going to save you. And even having the good things of life apart from Jesus is never going to satisfy you. So the gospel is so important. Now, now I want you to notice a little phrase here. I went back and just really studied this phrase carefully. I want you to look at verse 14. At that phrase, I, I, I underscored it in my Bible, put a little asterisk out by it. The Lord opened her heart to heed the things spoken by Paul. And I want to show you how salvation works. Because right here in one little phrase, I see what I call the divine side and the human side of salvation. It's right here. There's the divine side of salvation in this verse. Did you see it? The Lord did what to her? 
He opened her heart. You know what that is? That's the divine side of salvation. You understand that the Bible teaches us that unless the Holy Spirit draws a person, guess what? You can't come. God's Holy Spirit's the one that's going to draw. God's Holy Spirit's the one that's going to convict. So what I always say to people is, if you have a sensitive heart, if you have a tender heart, if God is moving you in any way whatsoever, guess what you ought to do? You ought to respond to that, not reject that. Because the divine side of salvation always begins with God. I mean, who made the first move to come to man anyway? It was God. God made the first move by devising a plan by which we could be redeemed and forgiven of our sins. So you see the divine side of salvation, but also there is the human side to salvation in that story too. It says the Lord opened her heart to what? To heed. To hear, to heed, to respond to the words of Paul. So see, here's what she does. The divine side of salvation is working. It's operating. God's opened her heart. She has a sensitive heart. She's listening. But you see, she also has to respond to what God's doing. That's the human side of salvation. The way I like to think about it is this. Grace is God throwing you the lifeline. Faith is you reaching out and getting a hold of it. So see, he can throw the lifeline all he wants. But if by faith you don't reach out and take a hold of it, guess what? You're going to spiritually drown. You're going to spiritually be doomed for all eternity. So you see how the gospel comes into the life of a tender-hearted person transforms and changes their life. You'll notice that, that as you continue to read on in the passage, it says in verse 15, And when she and her household were baptized, she begged them, saying, if you've judged me faithful to the Lord, come to my house, stay with us. So not only did she experience salvation, guess what? She influenced her house. Her whole household experienced salvation. Baptism didn't confer her salvation. Baptism became the outward symbol that she had been saved. And that's what baptism always does. It doesn't confer us. It doesn't confirm us in salvation. It just simply allows others to understand that something on the inside has happened to us. A transformation has occurred. So there's the gospel transformation of a tender heart. Now beginning with verse 16, going down through verse 24, you'll notice what I call the gospel transformation of a tormented heart. Notice what verse 16 says. It says, Now it happened as we went to prayer that a certain slave girl possessed with a spirit of divination, met us, who brought her masters much profit by fortune-telling. This girl followed Paul and us and cried out, saying, These men are servants of the Most High God, who proclaimed us the way of salvation. And this she did for many days. But Paul, greatly annoyed, turned and said to the, to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And he came out that very hour. But when her masters saw that their hope of profit was gone, they seized Paul and Silas, dragged them into the marketplace to the authorities, and they brought them to the magistrates and said, These men, being Jews, have exceedingly troubled our city. Here you see the gospel transformation of a tormented soul. Now, I noticed two things about this girl. I noticed, one, that she's a sin-sick soul. She is a sin-sick soul. She has, the Bible calls, a spirit of divination, a demonic spirit. She has uh, unbelievable abilities to tell the future. And people have seen a way to exploit that. You notice she's a slave. She's owned by other people. You realize today that if we're bound in sin that we're owned by that. In fact, the Bible says, uh, he who sins is the servant of sin. It can become your master. And here's a young girl, and she is slave to people who are exploiting her and using her. She has a demonic spirit. And you notice that the Bible says she's going around following Paul and this Silas and this body of believers. And she, as, as she's going... Connected with that crowd, she said, all oh, these men are men of the Most High God. And it, and it annoyed Paul. See, I think what annoyed Paul was is that he didn't want any connection with her because of what she represented. 
Sometimes you do have to break. Just being honest with you, folks. Sometimes you do have to just stand up and say, you know, I, I can't be in that crowd because being in that crowd gives the impression that I condone what's going on in the crowd. Now, there's a fine line there because I do, I do rub shoulders with lost people because how in the world am I going to, you know, make a connection with them and how in the world am I going to share the gospel with them but at the same time, I have to be cautious that my presence doesn't condone what is taking place in the crowd. And you'll notice that that's what Paul does. He stands up and, and, and he turns to her and you'll notice that he speaks directly to what possessed her. You know how it's a good way to get the devil out of somebody? And that's get Jesus in. Because when Jesus comes in, the devil got to go. And boy, I'll tell you, if we just lived our lives in a more committed fashion to the Lord, uh, we'd have less difficulties with that. She's a, she's a sin-sick soul, but she also becomes a set-free soul. The Lord sets her free. She's free of the bondage of what holds her. You say, well, you believe in, in demon activity? I do. I do believe it. I believe it because the Bible teaches it, and it's right here. In fact, probably one of these days we might come to fully realize how much of what's happening in America today is prompted by the dark underworld. I mean, I, I can't really comprehend how somebody that does not know anybody, I can't comprehend one, how somebody would just walk into a mall and take the life of people. But people that they don't even know. You know I, I just wonder, one of these days, when we get to see the full complexity of it, how much the dark world has been behind so much of what's going on. I know uh, years ago at Son of Sam, a uh, serial killer, that in some of his prison confessions, he, he, he made the statement that, that voices spoke to him. And you know what? I don't doubt it. I really don't doubt it. He said, voices, voices told me to do what I did. Now, a lot of people say, oh, well, that's, he's, just, he's just excusing his behavior. But what's behind behavior? And the only thing that can set us free from the world of darkness is the world of light. And, that, and, and, and that's, that's what Jesus is. He's light. And that's what Jesus came to do. He came to, to, to be light and, and he came to deposit in us light. So here is a gospel transformation of a, of a tormented heart. And you know what? There are people this morning who are tormented. They're not in church today. They spent a weekend living it up and they're tormented deep within. You know, they just have to, they just have to come back and go through that whole process again. You know why? Because it doesn't satisfy and it never ever will satisfy until they meet Jesus Christ. So you see the gospel transformation of a tender heart. You see the gospel transformation of a tormented heart. And then you see the gospel transformation of a tough heart. And that's this jailer. You'll notice that as you keep on reading in verses 19, 20, 21, uh, they take Paul, they take Silas, they beat them, they put them in jail, and, 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 and they, they turn them over in verse 25, to, to the jailer. It says, at, at midnight, Paul and Silas were praying. They were singing hymns to God. The prisoners were listening. And notice what happens. There, there's an earthquake, and you know the story if you've read your Bible. And the results was that the, the prison doors were open. Chains fell off the prisoners. And here's this tough jailer. He's tough. He might have been looked upon in Bible days as Mr. Mission Impossible because he's tough. But I got news for you. The gospel can change tough hearts. Really can. Can change tough hearts. I remember uh, in Op, Alabama, we had a guy there. We got on our hearts. We were praying for him to come to Jesus. Prayed and prayed and prayed. A lot of people, I think, probably had just about lost hope that he'd ever come to Christ. I remember that Sunday morning when he came into church. I remember Peggy was, she was on, the organ was on this side. And she was playing the organ at invitation. And I remember when it just, she just stopped playing. You know, I, I didn't look. I thought, well, she's lost her way. But, you know, just quit playing. But what it was, is she had seen what I hadn't seen. She had seen him make his break from the pew. Start coming down the aisle. 
And we had prayed and prayed and prayed for him. And he was tough. I'm telling you. He was tough. But the gospel can just transform and change tough hearts. He's still serving Jesus today. See, I mean, he, he, he didn't falter. He's still serving today. So here's this big old tough jailer. And he comes running in. And here's where, here's where I want to focus for the next five minutes. And here's how I want to end this message. Now really, this, this will help you in sharing the gospel with other people. It will help you in understanding the gospel. I want you to notice when, when he runs in, and I, I put a block around these two verses, verse 30 and 31 my Bible, put a little asterisk out by the side of them. This jailer, this tough jailer runs in, verse 30, says, and he, he, he brought him out, and here's what he said to him. He said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Now that's the question. And I want, I want to focus on that question for just a second. So I want you to just follow me. And, and I, I, want to, I want to look at that question in two ways as I end this message this morning. Number one, I want you to think with me about the asking of the question. The asking of it. No, notice, he, 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 he brings them out and he asks them this question. What must I do to be saved? And I, just look at the asking of that question for a second. I want, I want to share with you about three things about it. I want you to notice that first, it is an important question. Wouldn't you agree with that? That's, that's the most important question that can be asked right there. You know why it's important? Because of the end of the question. Sirs, what must I do to be what? Saved. That's why this question is so important. This question is so important because this question deals with salvation. Yours and mine. Your neighbors, your friends, your family members. It is an important question. It is the most important question that a person can ask. But I want you to notice the second thing about the asking of this question. Not only is it an important question, it's an individual question. You notice what he said, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? That's an individual question. And, and the question of salvation is exactly that. It's an individual question. It's a question I have to ask and answer. It's a question that you have to ask and answer. It's a question that every one of us have to answer. What must, what must I do to be saved? And you notice what he didn't say? He didn't say, he didn't say Paul, wh wh what I got to do to join the church? He didn't say that. He didn't say, what I got to do to be baptized? He didn't say that. He said, what I have to do to be saved? It's a personal question. But I want you to notice, thirdly, that it's what I call an informational question. You notice what he's asking for? He said, he said sirs, what must I do to be saved? He's asking for what? Information. See, that's why the gospel needs to be communicated. Because there are people around you, around me, around us, they need information. They need information about the gospel. So there, there, there's the asking of the question, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? And then obviously, number two, there's the answering of the question. And notice how Paul answers him in this verse 31. He said, so they said, Paul and Silas, here's what they, they said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and you'll be saved, and your household. So let's look at that for just a second. Because there's, there, there's, there's such weight in that answer. There's weight in the question, but there's weight in the answer. Because when I looked at the answer to the question, here's what I discovered. I discovered, one, that, that there's the person, the salvation, right here in this question. Believe on who? Lord Jesus Christ. There's the person. See, we don't need to get it confused. Salvation is not about a program and it's not about a place. It's about a person. And that person is Jesus Christ. And the only way a person can be saved is by coming to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus himself said, I'm the, I'm the what? I'm the way. I'm the truth. I'm the life. John 14, 6. And in Acts 4, 12, it says there's, there's no other name given under heaven by which a person can be saved. Just one name, the name of Jesus. So there's the person of salvation. But now watch it. In the question, there's not only the person of salvation, there's what I call the prerequisite of salvation. The prerequisite. 
the way it happens. Notice what he said to them. Do what? Believe. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. So Lord Jesus Christ, there, there's the person of our salvation. Have you done that? The prerequisite is believe. And, and, and let's qualify that for just a moment. Not just a head consent. Oh, I, I know Jesus is the Savior. That's not going to get it done. This word believe is stronger than that. Literally, it's the word from which we get a word trust. What, what you trust, you put everything in it. You're willing to put everything on it if you trust it. If you believe it, you're, you're willing to put everything you got on it. I was in a deer stand last hunting season up on Andy's place. And it, he had he'd put a little, uh, well it wasn't little, it was pretty high. A uh, little tripod type stand up on a big hill and I don't know why I went that day but I did you know some days men just don't use good sense and just you know the desire to want to go just gets you because the wind was blowing that day incredibly and when I, when I say incredibly I mean it wasn't just blowing it was gusting and uh, I sat up there in that chair for a little while and that wind just gusted on the edge of a clear cut with nothing to break it. And uh, one, one time I got out of the chair and got out on my knees because it was blowing so hard. And, uh, but you know what? I stayed. I stayed. I stayed till it turned dark. I stayed to hunt. And the whole time I stayed, I was wondering, I wonder if they drove those stakes deep enough. I wonder if they really, really drove, because I'm telling you, I've hunted in some wind, but when that thing is, you know, you feel stuff shifting like this right here. But you know something? I've never, ever, ever, I can honestly say this, I've never, ever said, I wonder if the blood was good enough. Never ever. I wonder if the blood was good enough. You know why? Because I believe. And I've, I, I've trusted. I put my all on it. Laid my all on the blood. That, that, that's what this word right here means. It means to believe it. It means to embrace it. It means to take it. See, if you don't, it does you no good. I mean, you can be as hungry as anybody. Go to a restaurant. And they lay the meal on the table in front of you. And if you never eat it, guess what? You're never going to satisfy the hunger. See? And the same way with salvation. If you don't believe it, then the longing's never going to be satisfied. So you see, the, you see the person of salvation, you see the prerequisite, and you also see the promise. What does he say? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And what? You're going to be saved. There's the promise right there. So the promise is, is that we've done what God asked us to do. Then guess what? We will be saved. No questions about it. No doubts whatsoever. We will be saved. Our job is to wherever we are in whatever conditions we're in to communicate the gospel because we just never know when doing that may transform a person's life. Yes, it's been about 107 years since the Titanic went down. April 15, 1912. About 1,520 something lives were lost on that ship. Only 710 survived. That's two out of three died. One out of three survived that ship. On board the Titanic, on its maiden boards was a gospel preacher by the name of John Harper. He was from Scotland. He was on his way to Chicago to preach in a meeting at the Moody Church when the ship hit the iceberg and sank. Listen to his word. He had such a, 
a passion. I went back and read some of his life story, but he had such a passion for lost people that when it became apparent what had happened and that the ship was going down, here was his cry. Women, children, and the lost first for the boats. Women, children, and the lost. There was a man who stood up in a testimony meeting in Canada years later. One of the 710 that made it. And here's what he said. He said, I was on a piece of wood, barely surviving in the 35 degree waters. And he said, like a miracle, the tides of the waters brought John Harper by me. And when he passed by me, he asked this question, Are you saved? He said, I said, no. He said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved. And he said, The tide just moved him away. He said, Then about five minutes or so later, miraculously, he came passing back by me. And he asked me the second time, Do you believe? And I said, no. And he said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. And he kept saying it until his voice faded out of my hearing. And there on a piece of driftwood, I asked Jesus to come into my life. And he said, I'm the last convert as far as I know of John Harper. We just never know when we have an opportunity to commit the gospel, communicate the gospel, what it can do. Because the good news of the gospel changes hearts in the most amazing ways. And that's why we have a responsibility to share it. Would you bow together with me in prayer? In just a moment, we're going to sing our hymn of invitation, give people an opportunity to respond to the word. And today... My challenge to us all is simply this. Are we faithful to communicate the gospel with those we come in touch with? Are we looking for opportunities to share the good news of how Jesus loved so much that He would go to the cross, that He would die there, that He would be buried, and that He would raise again? Are we faithful in sharing that good news. Perhaps today, where we stand and sing in a few moments, you want to make that a personal altar and just say, Lord, help me to see the opportunities to encourage and to share with my friends and family in this next week the good news that can change everything in their lives. And I believe the gospel can do that. I believe it can change everything. It is transforming. It does bring about dramatic change if people embrace it and believe it. And so, Lord, help us to accept that challenge and to be obedient, to just have eyes open. That, that's all I ask this morning. You just say, Lord, help me to have eyes open to opportunities that you'll give me this week to encourage people about their relationship with the Lord. Of course, if you're here today, you've never trusted Christ as your personal Savior, never, like Lydia, openly done that and been baptized like she was, then I want to encourage you. Let that be something that you allow God to open your heart to today so that you can respond to that. Follow Him in belief that way. Father, thank you so much for your word today. Thank you for its challenge that it brings to our hearts. Thank you, Lord, that those of us who are saved today know what it is to experience gospel transformation. We know what it is to be changed from the inside out. We know what it is for God to take us as we were, change us, and make us who we are. And Father, we thank you for that transformational change that your gospel has brought into our lives. Now, Lord, help us to be faithful in sharing that with others. 
In Jesus' name, amen. Our hymn of invitation this morning is 183. Hymn 183 is our hymn. Only trust Him. Only trust Him. Would you stand together as we turn to that and as we sing this hymn?